right, let's look at our last section, which is 6.5. And it's on solving triangles. So the idea in this section is we're going to be working with um, right triangles. And the goal is going to be to figure out how big each angle is and how long each side is. That's what we're going to try to figure out. Since we're working with right triangles, it's important to kind of remember what that is. Um, can someone remind me what what is a right triangle? Yeah. A right triangle is where one of the angles is 90 degrees exactly, and the other two angles are different. Normally, it would be like 36 degrees or 45, 45. Those combos. Yeah, as long as long as yeah, they all add up to 180, but um, yeah. So in a right triangle, we have a triangle with a 90 degree angle. Um, what's the side across from the 90 called? Yeah? Opposite? Um, no, no, we're going to talk about those two words, but this side would never be considered either opposite or adjacent. But I'm going to talk about those words in a little bit. Yeah? It's the hypotenuse. And what do we call the two other sides? Yeah? Well, opposite and adjacent or the legs. Yep. So here's a diagram of what we just said. So we got the 90, the hypotenuse, the two legs. Generally, the names we use for the letters are A, B, and C. And remember that the other two angles in a right triangle have to be acute. That's because they all have to add up to 180. And you've already used 90 for the right angle. So the other two have to be less than 90. Uh, for the opposite and adjacent, it's really dependent on where you're going to be having the, where you're basing the angle off. Yes, yep, exactly, and we're going to talk about that. Yep. Okay, um, so there's a theorem we can use when we're trying to figure out sides in a triangle. If we know two of them, we can find the third one. Um, and what it's the Pythagorean theorem. And what, what is that theorem? Yeah? And can you explain that more generally without using the A, an A, B, or C? Can you be more specific? Yes. So the leg squared plus the other leg squared equals the hypotenuse squared. You can call them A, B, C, X, Y, Z. I don't care what you call the sides. But it's the concept. Leg squared plus leg squared equals hypotenuse squared. Um, why? Why does leg squared plus leg squared equal hypotenuse squared? <coughs> Do you know what? Well, you're going to find out why. All right, let's take a look at why. So here's a picture. And inside the picture, uh, we've, got, we've got a square. And then we have another square uh, inside. OK, what I want to do is find the area of that shape in red. But I want to do it two different ways. Can anybody give me a really simple way to find the area of the red square? Yeah? Um, you, for, to find the area of the red square, you can find the four areas of the triangles and subtract that from the total area of the big square. Oh boy, that sounds complicated. That's too much math for me. I can't, I can't do that. I'm going to do that. But I want, I want a simple way first. Um, you can just do C squared, like C times C. Yeah. So the area of the red square, you can find it by just doing C times C. Like that gives you C squared. Okay, and let's call that the first way that we found the area. Well, now I want to do the area again. All right, now, now I feel warmed up. Now I'm ready for something more complicated. Um, so what did, what did you say about a different way we could do it? 
that you could find the four areas of the triangles and subtract that from the total area of the big tri of the big rectangle. Yeah. The big, yeah, rectangle. So let's pretend, let's call this the blue square. If you take the blue square, and let's call this the green triangle. Does everyone agree that those green triangles are the same in each corner? Okay. So if you take the blue triangle, a blue blue square, and you subtract four of the green triangles, that will also give you the area of the red square. Okay. Take the blue, subtract out each triangle, and you'll have the red square. Okay. So let's try that. Um, Let's look at the, the blue square. Um, what's the length of the blue square? Yep. A plus B. It's A plus B. And what's the width of the blue square? Yep. A plus B. And now let's find the area of the green triangle. What's the formula for the area of a triangle? Yep. One half base times height. One half base times height. Okay. What's the base of the triangle? Yeah. The base of the triangle is. Do you want the short side or the long side? It doesn't really matter. It would be a and well, a or b. Yeah. So it's just one half. So there's one. A times b, right? Whichever it doesn't really matter which one you call which. Okay. So we got the area of the blue square minus four green triangles. What do you get when you do um, a plus b times a plus b? Yeah? Those would be something that are in it, but that's not the only bit about it. it would one, be... yeah, one more term in the middle. Yeah? A squared plus 2AB plus B squared. Now, what's 4 times 1 half AB? Two AB. Yeah, so minus 2AB. And now, what happens there? Yeah, what cancels out? 2AB and 2AB. 2AB? And negative 2AB. And negative 2AB. So what did we get for the area of the red square doing it this way? We got A squared plus B squared. And let's call that um, the second half for finding the area of the square. Well, what do we know about the way we found the area the first time and the way we found it the second time, they should both be what? Equal. They should both be equal. It's the same shape. So that means that the way we found it in method one and the way we found it in method two are the same. So method one gave us c squared, and method two gave us a squared plus b squared. And that's a, a proof of uh, one way you can prove the Pythagorean theorem. Okay, that's more of a visual, really geometric proof. There's many other ways to prove it besides that. Okay, any question on that? All right, so now we know where the Pythagorean theorem uh, can come from. All right, so next, uh, I'm going to give you the definitions of the six trig functions. Uh, we did this before with unit circle trig, but that was all based on a coordinate. This is going to be based on some words that a couple people were saying earlier. Um, opposite, adjacent, and hypotenuse. Let's start with the first three. The sine, the cosine, and the tangent. So the sine is all of the trig functions are defined to be a fraction. 
of the length of one side to the length of another side. And there's six different ways we pair the sides up. The sine is defined to be the ratio of the length of the opposite over the length of the hypotenuse. Cosine is the length of the adjacent over the hypotenuse. And tangent is the length of opposite over adjacent. Now, it's a length divided by a length. So when you divide two numbers, like 8 feet divided by 10 feet, what do you get for a unit on the final answer? 8 feet divided by 10 feet. Yeah? Yeah. So your unit would be what? Well, that's the question. So I'm not interested in the number, just the unit. Yeah? It, it would be a decimal. Yeah, yeah, that's the number, though. I just want to know about the unit. It's the same, it's the same. X feet divided by Y feet. What's your unit on the final answer? Yep. Actually, they cancel, so there's no They cancel. There is no unit. So whenever you're writing down the answer to a sine, a cosine, or a tangent, there is no unit. It's just a number without a label to it. Okay. So there's no label on these answers. There is a label on what you plug in. Like you might plug in the sine of 42 degrees. Well, that's what you're plugging in. But what you're getting out is just a number without a label. Okay. And the next three have a connection with the first three. Does anyone remember what you do to the three on the right? How you get them from the three on the left? Yep. Yeah. The, yeah. The cosecant would be the length of the hypotenuse over the length of the opposite, and the secant would be. Yeah. Yep. The hypotenuse over adjacent. And what about the cotangent? Yeah. Adjacent over opposite. So there's a trick you can use to try to remember them. Um, and it has to do with kind of these letters that I'm circling. Does anybody know the Sokotoa? So sine <coughs> is opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. And tangent is opposite over adjacent. Right? So you can you can use that Sokotoa to try to remember what the what the fractions are. Um, I had asked one time what how do you remember it? And somebody had told me Sacagawea. Um, it's not Sacagawea, that, that's not quite gonna help, but Sakatoa helps. Um, that's that's what you can use. Okay. Yeah. You should just like write that like underneath that high thing it's just it's always there. Sakatoa? Yeah. I could, but I want to make sure you know it. Yeah. Question? No, no, just making the, the motion because like you can like do it here, but also like the, for the shops and everything, you could get have a like a wood engraved or metal engraved thing, not like a. Oh, yes, I could. You're right. I could. Yeah, but we already got pie up there. Um, and then you really don't have to remember the three on the right because if you know the three on the left, you just go home. Now, use some terms here that some people may or may not be familiar with. Opposite and adjacent. Okay. Opposite and adjacent are what we call relative terms. It's kind of like saying left and right. There is no definitive direction in this room that is necessarily left. It's all relative to which way you face. So for me, left is the door. For you, left is the window. Because um, we're facing different ways. So the way you're facing in a triangle is usually marked with an angle. It's never the 90. Let's say you were standing where theta is. If you were standing there, opposite is the side that is furthest away in the triangle. It's the side that if you got rid of it, it has no effect on this angle at all. That angle would still be there. Adjacent is the side that's next to the angle. 
If you got rid of the adjacent side, you wouldn't have an angle here anymore. Okay? So adjacent is right next to the angle. And hypotenuse is always across from the 90. Hypotenuse is the only side that's kind of universal. That never changes. Okay? I guess kind of a comparison in this room would be up. It doesn't matter which way you're facing. Up is always the same. The opposite direction of gravity. That's up. Yep. How long will they also like for rotations? Like for if you're, if you're looking out at a conical sphere or like a pyramid or something, what's up, left, and right? Like the thing about the third dimension is like also like rotation. Because like yes, on like a I'm just saying that like up is the same if you're like if you're turning up 180 degrees, but if you're like trying this way or that way, then up is also a different direction. Okay, yeah. So I guess it depends on how you can. So we would always consider up the ceiling. Yeah. No matter which way you're facing. But the, but but yeah. the main thing is that, like, yeah. you base it all on theta, and theta is always, like, the same. So for, yeah, opposite and adjacent, we base it off theta. So what side would be opposite in the triangle on the right? Opposite would be the bottom one for this one, while well, adjacent is the one right on the side. Yep. But adjacent is always going to be right beside the thing. Yep, adjacent is always what's right next to the angle. And hypotenuse is no matter what, opposite <coughs> of the 90 degrees. Always opposite the 90. Yep. No matter what. No matter yeah. what. Alright, so if we have two triangles that all have the same angles, um, they're not necessarily congruent. Um, does anybody remember the word that you can use to describe two triangles, like a 30, 60, 90, and another 30, 60, 90? Yeah? Yeah, they, they're considered similar. And the idea of similar triangles is that if you want to find the sine of 40 degrees, it doesn't matter if you find the sine of 40 degrees in a small triangle, or you find the sine of 40 degrees in a huge triangle. It's going to be the same thing. The sine of 40 is always the sine of 40. Let me show you, um, show you an example. Here's two triangles. And these two triangles are similar because they, they're both 30, 60, 90. But there's a scale factor between them. What's the um, scale factor to change the triangle on the left into the one on the right. Basically, what, what happened to each side? Yeah? It's a scale factor of two. It's a scale factor of two, it doubled. So let's pick an angle and let's do the let's do one trig function. Um, let's do 30. Let's find the sine of 30 in the small triangle. Um, what's the definition for sine again? What side divided by what side? Yeah. It's opposite over hypotenuse. What side is opposite the 30? Yeah. One. And what's the hypotenuse? Two. So in the small triangle, the sine of 30 came out to a half. Now let's do the sine of 30 in a big triangle. What side is opposite the 30 this time? Yeah? Two. And what's the hypotenuse? Yeah. It's four. And that's still a half. So the point here is it does not matter what size triangle you draw when you do trig functions. Small ones, big ones. <coughs> if you draw it correctly, the sine of 30 will always come out to one half. And if you're not sure where these numbers originally came from, these are special right triangles from geometry. 1, 2, square root of 3 is just common numbers you can use to make a 30, 60, 90. Okay, so any questions on this idea? Part right there. Yeah, the triangles So, how do you find all six trig functions if I give you one of them? 
Let's say I do something, I'm going to do this in a second. I'm going to tell you that the sine is 5 sixths. Well, if I give you one trig function, you automatically know two of the sines. Okay. Depends on what trig function I give you. If I give you cosine, you'd know the adjacent and the hypotenuse. Okay. But once I give you a trig function, use it to label two sides of the triangle. Now, to do all six trig functions, you're going to need the third side. But if you have two of them, how can you get the third side? Yeah? Pythagorean theorem. Yeah, we could just do the Pythagorean theorem. So, label the two sides you know. Use the Pythagorean theorem to find the side you don't know. Now you can answer the question. So now you can determine any trig function that you want to find. Okay, I'm really kind of spelling it out, but you could you could shorten that if if it makes sense to you. So label two sides, use the Pythagorean theorem to find the third, and now you can answer the question. Okay, so here's our problem. It says, let theta be an acute angle where the sine of it is 5 sixths. Okay, we don't know what the angle is. We can find the angle if we know how to do inverse trig, which we're going to talk about. But that's not the point. I don't care what theta is. All I care about is the six trig functions of theta. The sine, the cosine, the tangent, all that stuff. Okay, so let's label um, two sides. It doesn't matter how you draw your triangle, as long as you make it a right triangle and you put theta somewhere. What two sides do we know based on what they told us? Yeah. We know the opposite and the hypotenuse. Yep. We know the opposite and we know the hypotenuse. Yeah. Because we know those two, we can then lay out the equation for the correct. Right. Pythagorean theorem. Yes, and now we're going to use the Pythagorean theorem. We're going to get the third side, and then we can answer the question that they want us to, which is write all six trig functions. For this, all you need to do is set C as six. Okay, so uh, six. Six squared minus, or it's equal to five squared plus b squared or a squared. Okay. And then you already said to minus it to the other side? Yeah. Okay. And that's going to be what a, a squared is after we... So we're going to get 11 equals a squared. The square root of 11 equals a. Yep. And we will leave the answer as a square root. When you're finding the trig functions, like they're asking you this problem. Um, leave your answer exact. Okay. That means we could end up with square roots in the bottom, and if we do, we need to fix it. Okay. So let's write all six. Sine, cosine. Well, sine we didn't really have to write. We already had that one. For cosine, it's going to be the square root of 11 over 6. It's going to be square root of 11 over 6. And how about the tangent? This one's going to start off as 5 over the square root of 11, mm -hmm. but we're going to have to change it up by multiplying it by the square root of 11 over the square root of 11, which will get you 5 square roots of 5 times square root of 11 over 11. Yep. So those are our first three. Um, what's the name of the function you get when you flip the sign? Yep. Cosecant. cosecant. And the cosecant is going to be equal to... Yep. 6 over 5. 6 over 5. Okay, and the secant? 
That's going to be equal to. We have, have to fix it so that the square root is not the value. Correct. So uh, six times the square root of eleven over eleven. Yep. Six square root of eleven over eleven. And the cotangent might be easier to think of what the tangent was originally, which was five over the square root of eleven. That might help. So what's the cotangent? Yeah. The square root of eleven over five. And there you go. So that's how you find the six trig functions of an angle if you're given one of them. Keep in mind that is not finding the angle. We didn't do that. But we could very easily. Right, let's try this. Find the six trig functions of theta. Um, what do you have? What do you got to find first this time? Yeah? The hypotenuse. Which trig function did they basically give me here? Yeah, they basically gave me the tangent in a way, but they, they put it in a diagram form. They gave me the opposite and the adjacent. What's the, um, what's the hypotenuse? Yep. A hypotenuse is going to be 5 squared plus 12 squared, which we have 25 plus 144, which would be 169. Mm -hmm. uh, and that would be 13. 13, yes. This is a certain kind of triangle where all the sides come out to be integers. Um, does anybody know what you call a right triangle where all the sides are integers? 3, 4, 5 is another one. There's an infinite amount of these that are all different. Legs? Um, no, where no. are things in It's actually two words. Yeah? Mm -hmm. It's a something, um, um, no, not a perfect triangle. That's a good guess, though. It's called a Pythagorean triple. Yeah, Pythagorean triple is when all the sides come out to integers. And when I say there's infinitely many, I wouldn't count like 3, 4, 5, and 6, 8, 10 as different ones. That's just a scale factor of 3, 4, 5. I mean, there's an infinite amount of triangles that have different side lengths. Okay, not just a scale factor. And this is one, 5, 12, 13. Okay, um, so what's, what's the sign going to be? Yeah? It's going to be 5 over 13. And the cosine is going to be? Yeah? 12 over 13. And the tangent? Yeah. 5 over 12. Opposite over adjacent, which is 5 over 12. And to get the cosecant, secant, and cotangent, we would take all of those and flip them. Yep. So cosecant, 13 fifths. Secant is 13 twelfths. And the cotangent is 12 fifths. Any question on that? Alright, let's look at this one. It says, use the diagram below to find the six trig functions of 45. So I started you off with a 45, 45, 90 right triangle. Now, what did we say about the sides of the triangle when you're trying to figure out a trig function? 
matter. It doesn't matter. So you can use any 45, 45, 90 triangle that you can think of. I would try to number these sides as simple as you can. So does anybody have a thought how I can label these sides so I have something to work with? Because I have to give them lengths, but they can be any length you want as long as they would be appropriate to a 45, 45, 90. Yep. Well, first off, we know that whether either the opposite or adjacent, they're going to be the exact same. Mm -hmm. So, one, five, any of those numbers should work. So okay, I'd so say, yeah, we can I'd make... Say, yeah, go ahead. I'd say that, like, five would probably be one of the easier ones to deal with. Okay, you could, you could do five. The smaller you make the number, the easier it's going to be. Yeah? Because the length of one hypothesis would be square root of two. Yeah, you could, you could do one, one, square root of two. You could do five, five, and then square root of 50. That would work, but what's going to happen is the square root of 50 is going to need to be reduced. If you do one and one, there's nothing to reduce on the square root. Okay, so that's the first step. You have to figure out what the side length should be. Now you can do the trig functions. Okay, um, what's the side of 45? It doesn't matter which angle you use as your point of reference because they're the same. Um, uh, one over the square root of two. Okay, one over the square root of two, and then once you fix it, what would you have? Two. Two. got to fix it so there's no square root in the bottom. One over a square root of two is a good start. Oh, one over two. Uh, so how do you fix having a square root in the bottom? What do you multiply? You multiply it, you square it? Mm, you can't square it. You have to multiply the top and the bottom by the same. <coughs> oh, there's. Okay. Hey, buddy, what do you multiply top and bottom by? Square root of 2 over the square root of 2. Square root of 2 over the square root of 2, which is essentially 1. Okay, that's all you can multiply a fraction by and not change it. So now you get square root of 2 over 2. Okay, how about the cosine? It's going to be the same thing because I saw it's isosceles. Opposite and adjacent are the same thing. Right? So square root of 2 over 2. And how about um, tangent of 45? That would be 1. It would be 1. Opposite over adjacent. And for the other ones, we'll basically just be multiplying the uh, sine and cosine by 2. So we just have square root of two for those two, and then the other one wouldn't change. Yep, so the first two, um, square root of two over one, and then square root of two over one, those are the same. And when you flip one, it stays the same. Okay, so there's your six trig functions of 45. I think there's a question in the book that says something like, use theorem. 6.5 to figure out the six trig functions of an angle like this. It basically just means to draw this diagram. Okay. I don't really refer to the theorem number when I do the notes. So, However you can figure out trig functions, if it says to draw a diagram, you can do it however, whatever kind of diagram you want to draw. Okay, let's try this one. So this says find the six trig functions of 60 degrees, oh, and 30. So I'll give you a hint. Um, you're going to need to draw an equilateral triangle to do this one. Why do you think I'm drawing an equilateral triangle to figure out trig functions of 30, 60, and 9, 30 and 60? Yeah. Because an equilateral is on 60 and 30 is on a multiple of 60. 
Okay, I agree that all the angles in the equilateral are 60. I don't see any 30s in that triangle, though. I wait. 30s are multiple of 60, so good. I need 30. Well, 60 is a multiple yeah, of 30. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. How's this going to help us with 30s, though? Because to figure out a 30, you got to have a 30 in the triangle. And right now, we have a 60, a 60, and a 60. How are we going to get 30? Yeah. If we split the equilateral triangle in half, we'll have 30s up top and 60s on the sides. Yep. And then we'll have 90 right on the in-between down below. Yep, so that's a 90. That's a 60 because it was equilateral. And up top you would have a 30. Okay, we're not going to go through the proof why, but when you draw, you can think of it a couple different ways. When you draw an angle bisector in an equilateral triangle, it bisects the opposite side into two equal segments, which basically means these two triangles are congruent, which means it has to be a 30 and a 30. But we don't. We're not going through the proof. <clears throat> okay, so now we've got a, a 30, 60, 90. And we've got to label some sides. The best approach here is to pick a number for one of the original sides of the equilateral triangle and then work from there. What would be a good number for, say, this, this side over here? Yeah. One. You could do one. If you do one, what does that mean this side would be? 0. 0.5. 0. 0.5. Remember, these are two equal segments now. So if you do one, that's 0. 0.5. And then you'd have two sides, and you can use Pythagorean theorem to get to 30. Anybody have another thought on a number? Yeah, if you do two for this side, what does it make the bottom side? One. One. Now you just don't have to deal with a fraction for the bottom side. Um, and how are we going to get this other leg? Yeah? It's going to be the uh, square root of three. Yeah. Because if you square two, it's going to be four. And with one, it stays one. Yep. Yeah. So when you use Pythagorean theorem, it's the same triangle I just drew right here. One, two, square root of three. Okay, but you may have to figure out the side lengths yourself. And remember, it doesn't matter what side lengths you use, as long as they are appropriate for a 30, 60, 90. If you want to do 1.5 and then figure out Pythagorean theorem for the third, that works. All right, so let's do um, the third. Um, let me do it like this. Okay, um, what's the sign of 30? Uh, sine of 30 degrees is one half. Yep, sine is a half. Okay, what's the uh, what's the cosine? Sine of 30 over 30. Yep, square root of 3 over 2. And the tangent of 30 would be? Yep. And when you fix it? Um, square root of 0 over 30. Perfect. I'm not going to go through flipping them, but to get the other trig functions, you would flip them. Now let's do the 60s. What's the sine of 60? So now you have to switch your perspective in the triangle, the opposite and adjacent switch. Tangent of 60 is going to be square root of 3. What's the 
sine of 60 degrees. Yep. Yeah, it's going to be opposite over hypotenuse. Remember, when you switch your angle, your opposite and adjacent switch. Um, how about cosine 60? Yep. That's one half. And tangent of 60s, acts, what did you say that was? Oh, um, uh, square root three. What is it? Square root three. Yeah, just square root three. So here's your first three for 60, and your first three for 30. You just flip them to get the last three. Any questions on that? Okay. Um, all right, so last thing. Um, complementary. What does it mean if two angles are complementary to each other? Yeah. They add up to 90 degrees. Yeah, they add up to 90 degrees. Now, why in a right triangle are the two acute angles always complementary? Yeah. Because a triangle always has 180 degrees, so you automatically have a 90 degree angle. Yep. Right. So you already have the 90 used up. The other two have to add up to 90, and that means complementary. Yep. All right. So when we labeled the sides of the triangle, what are the letters that we use normally? Yeah. Um, like alpha, beta, theta stuff. Um, whatever letters you think we normally use for sides. Oh, A, B, C. A, B, C. So we use generally A, B, C for the sides, and we generally use Greek letters for the angles. Does anybody remember the name of the Greek letter in the lower right? Cross for A. Yep. Uh, no, gamma looks kind of like that. So we are going to talk about gamma when the right angle goes away. But we'll save that for a few weeks. That is an important letter. Yep. No? Anyone remember what this is called? Mike? Is it theta? What is it? Theta. Theta? Yeah. Uh, theta is the circle with a line in the middle. That's theta. Yeah? Um, no, omega looks kind of like a W shape. At least a lowercase omega. Uh, any other guesses what that is? No, we talked about it. Way back. Well, it's the first Greek letter. Alpha. Alpha. It's lowercase alpha. Beta. And the one that has the long tail, kind of looks like a B, is beta. So the reason that when we do problems and on the test, I'm generally going to refer to angles as Greek letters is because then it eliminates confusion about what, I'm, what I want to know. Okay. If I ever ask you for a Greek letter, that is an angle. If I ask you for an English letter, that's a sign. I don't like using capital and lowercase letters um, because if you start to use other letters, sometimes the capital and lowercase version looks the same. So like, let's say you use a C. Well, if you wanted to use capital C for a side and lowercase c for an angle, it just gets confusing. It's like you can't tell which one is which. So we're going to always stick with that. You always want to make A opposite alpha and B opposite beta. Doesn't matter which way your triangle faces. If you want to face it that way, that's fine. A alpha, B beta. And generally, C is reserved for the hypotenuse. But the A and the B can switch. Okay, so I'm not crazy about how our book does it with the capital and lowercase letters. I tend to stick with Greek letters. All right, let's look at, let's look at this diagram. What's the sign of alpha? Yeah. A over C. Yeah. A over C. 
Okay, now watch what I'm going to do. What angle is complementary in that picture to alpha? Beta. Yeah, beta. So I'm going to do beta. And instead of taking the sign, I'm going to put the word co in front. I'm going to take the co sign. I'm going to take the co function of the angle that was complementary to alpha. What's the cosine of beta? A over C. That's also A over C. Cosine of beta is adjacent over hypotenuse. Okay, let's, do, uh, let's do another one. Let's do the tangent of alpha. What's the tangent of alpha? Yeah? That's A over B. Now, what function do you get if you put the word co in front of that? Yeah? Cotangent. Cotangent. That's called a co-function. So you get the cotangent. And what is the angle that's complementary to alpha? Yeah? Uh, beta. beta. Cotangent is adjacent uh, over opposite. Would be again. And this pattern of changing the function to its cofunction and changing the angle to a complementary one is called the complementary angle theorem. And the complementary angle theorem very simply says if you have two cofunctions of complementary angles, they come out the same. They are equal. All right, so let's try one of the numbers. I'm not interested in an answer to, the, to what I'm writing. I'm interested in something that's equal to what I'm writing. Based on that theorem, what would be the same as the sine of 40? The what of what? Yep. Yes. So why is that useful, finding a different function that's equal to what you started with? Well, let me show you. I want to simplify the sine of 35 minus the cosine of 55. And again, I'm more interested here maybe in a reason than I am the actual number. What are sine and cosine? What did I say we call those? Yeah, they're called co-functions, right? So let me, let me actually, I can, I can write that down. I said it, it's probably, it's probably better for me to write it. Sine and cosine are one here. Secant, cosecant, that's another pair. Tangent. Co-tangent. These are called co-functions. So another way you could say it is what's the co-function of tangent? It's called cotangent. What's the co-function of cotangent? Tangent. Okay. You don't say co-cotangent. Uh, just tangent and cotangent are co-functions. Yeah. Is calculus the cal come from the is there any like where does oh, like where is like the origin of the word? Yeah, is it just like um, Latin? Uh, you know, I'd have to look it up and see. Well, I know co like usually means with. Yeah. With something. Um, I'm sure, there has to be an origin to it, but I don't know off the top of my head. That's a good question. I'll look it up. Um, all right. So I think I just asked Jade this. What What did you say? Sine and cosine are. They're co-functions. And what are 35 and 55? They're complementary. You have co-functions of complementary angles. Co-functions of complementary angles are equal to each other. So what does that mean this is going to come out to? It's going to come out to zero. It's going to come out to zero. Yep. How about this one? 
The tangent of 20 divided by the cotangent of 70. Yeah? It's going to be 1. These are cofunctions. These are complementary. And we're dividing two things that are the same. Now, if this was the tangent of 21 divided by the cotangent of 70, well, it doesn't work. 21 and 70 are not cofunctions. All right? How about this one? Start with what's inside the parentheses. Secant and cosecant are what? Cofunctions. Cofunctions. What about 75 and 15? Complementary. And this, this is going to work. We're dividing two things that are the same. So what does this whole thing turn into? 2 plus 3. Like 2 times 1 plus 3. Yep. Which is? 5. So it's a little trick you can use to simplify some trig expressions in a very, very, very specific situation. All right. And that's um, 6.5 part 1. So tomorrow we'll start 6.5 part 2. I have a feeling we may not finish it. Uh, but Thursday is a review day, so if we need to finish a little on Thursday, you might only have about 40 minutes to review instead of 60. That's okay. Uh, yep. Okay, so on the board, make sure you copy down um, the questions. Uh, there are two that are not in the book. I want you to do the sine divided by the cosine and the tangent minus the cotangent.